Welcome back, everyone. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, Mengmi Zhang. She's uh, um, uh, one of the top postdoctoral scholars uh, in my group, and she's uh, going to do a very exciting presentation. She has, uh, I don't want to spoil it, but um, uh, she's a person that has multiple faces. So if you see uh, one of these uh, strange avatars here, that's, uh, that's Mengmi. And she will talk about uh, something that's uh, extremely cool super exciting with a, a tutorial presentation for you to, you to learn uh, about uh, deep generative uh, models. So without further ado, Mengmi, please. Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to the third tutorial. Uh, yeah, my name is Mengmi, I'm a postdoc from Gabriel's lab. For those of you who have not seen me before, uh, just to clarify, this is not actually how I look like. <laughs> Since I'm gonna talk about generative models today, I thought it might be fun to do a live demo of how we can use generative models in our daily life. For example, in the Zoom meetings, instead of mimicking fictional characters in the movie, the generative models could also generalize to a real person. So I'm gonna switch my faces. Uh, just hold on. Like this, like Steve Jobs. And also it could like extend to a person in a painting. And I can also move my head a little bit and uh, make funny facial expressions. Yeah. What is more interesting is that the generative models has been trained on celebrity faces and yet they have no problem generalizing um, to, for example, animal faces. Like now I'm mimicking a monkey. or uh, a cartoon character like SpongeBob. All right, for, so, for those of you who wonder what is the deepfake techno technology behind the demo, here is a peek about the algorithm. I also attached the link here and the paper for you to check them out. Here's the source image, which is the avatar you want to be. And then we can, uh, and this is the driving frame, which is the real me. And then we can calculate the optical flow, which tracks the movement of individual pixels between individual uh, between adjacent frames. We can also calculate the occlusion map, which denotes a part of the background that needs to be repainted. Together with the features extracted from the source images, these three components form a latent representation. And then we could pass this to the generator, and the generator could then synthesize new frames and broadcast to Zoom. And now I'm presenting you an overview of deep learning frameworks in machine learning. In the previous tutorial, Andrea and the, the rest talk about the basics of constructing a convolution neural net and establish connections between activations of the artificial neurons and the neurons in mouse brains. In this tutorial, I will move on to unsupervised learning. In particular, we will be focusing on, on generative neural networks and how we can leverage on these generative models to reconstruct images from brain signals. Here is the uh, outline of the tutorial. I will first talk about the basics of uh, visceral, uh, generative visceral networks and an uh, advanced version of the uh, of GAN, which is big by GAN, followed by a review of existing image reconstruction methods from brain uh, signals. Before I go straight away to talk about GANs, I want to introduce you a very important concept in deep learning, which is deconvolution. In the past, we have been talking a lot about convolution. So the blue patch here is the input. The sign patch is the output feature map. We observe that the 2D convolution typically reduces the output feature map dimension. In this particular example, the feature map sizes decreases from five to five of five by five to uh, three by three. In contrast, deconvolution does the opposite. Here again, input is in blue and the output is sign. The deconvolution operation upsamples the input feature map from two by two to four by four. In PyTorch, here is a function for deconvolution and here is an example uh, usage uh, below. All right, now let's talk about GANs. Just a little bit of history. GAN was first invented by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. Since then, GAN has been a popular research topic. So 
So what is GAN? As this name indicates, it's a plural term. The GAN consists of two, net two networks. One is a generator, the other is a discriminator. The generator takes a random noise vector and generates an image. The role of the discriminator is to tell whether a given image is real or fake, which is uh, generated by the generator. These two networks fight against each other. In game theory, it is called min-max game. In other words, each of these two parties is trying to minimize their own losses given their opponent is perfect. For example, here, if I'm a discriminator, I'm assuming I'm facing a perfect generator which can generate realistic images to fool me. Thus, I'm trying to minimize the number of mistakes I'm gonna make in misclassifying uh, fake images as real images. Now let's take a closer look at the architecture of the discriminator. Same as other object recognition networks that you, that you have probably seen so far, it's just another uh, one network consisting of stacks of convolution layers. It takes an image as the input and outputs a probability vector indicating whether it is real or fake image. A couple of practice notes here. So this is the code uh, of PyTorch code loading the images. To make the network robust variations, you have to perform the image augmentation, such as gating and rotation. And since we have the RALU layers, which uses zero as threshold, we also want to normalize the image pixel values from zero to one to minus one to one. In the end of the network, to make sure the network outputs probabilities, we add a sigma function, which normalizes the values to zero to one. Uh, by the way, instead of fully connected layers, since this network consists of stacks of convolution layers, we also named this GAN as deconvolution GAN, which is uh, in short of the DC GAN. Here's a diagram of the generator. It does the, uh, exactly the opposite of the discriminator by replacing convolution layers with deconvolution layers. The generator takes a, uh, a sorry, so here, uh, what you see on the right is the snippet of how we constructed the discriminator. And the arrows show here uh, corresponding with the different layers of the convolution. And take note that in the end, we have to add in a sigma function. All right, so here's the uh, diagram of the generator. It does the, exactly the opposite of the discriminator by replacing the convolution layer with deconvolution layers. And the generator takes a vector of random, uh, random noise as inputs. And that, that is for each element in this one dimension uh, vector, we randomly sample number from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one. In PyTorch, this is how we implement it. The generator outputs a tensor dimension of three by 64 by 64. However, the generator itself has no notion about what this tensor represents. Thus, we need a hyperbolic tangent function to normalize all the values in the tensor to be from minus one to one as a representation of the image. This is a consistent with the real input image pixel values to the discriminator, which also ranges from minus one to one. Take note that this normalization is essential since we do not want the discriminator to easily capture the difference offsets between the real pictures and the generated tensors. Here is the uh, snippet of code constructing the generator. The arrows to show the corresponding deconvolution layers in the end, we added a uh, tan tangent function. Now we have the uh, constructed discriminator and generator. Let us see how we can train this neural nets at the same time. Again, to remind you that the generator and discriminator are playing against each other in a min max game. Thus, we can divide the training into two parts. So first, we assume we have a perfect generator which generates a bunch of images. We can train a discriminator differentiating the fake images from the real ones. Just like training other object rec recognition network, the discriminator takes either a batch of real images with the ground truth label as real. It performs a binary classification of these real images and backprop the gradients like this. Similarly, we could also label a batch of generated images as fake, compute the loss again, and then backprop the gradients. The parts of the code shows the training 
of the discriminator with all the fake images labeled as fake. This is the first part. And then the second part uh, shows the training of the discriminator with all the real images labeled as real. So far, the training story has been very straightforward. And let's now see how we can train the generators. First, without the uh, real images, we could simply concatenate the discriminator and the generator as one big network. Thus, we can compute a binary classification loss and perform the gradient back propagation from the very end of the discriminator all the way back to the beginning of the generator. Since the objective is to train the generator, we want the generated images to fold the discriminator into classifying them into real images. Therefore, the ground truth for ground truth label for the generated images are now going to be real. From the point of view of the generator, that is to say how much the generator needs to correct itself in order to make sure the discriminator outputs the uh, the real labels for its generated images. Note here, this is an uh, important difference from training the discriminator where the ground truth label for the generated images have now changed from fake to real. And this is the code for training the generator. And this is where the real uh, labels have been assigned to the generated images. Since 2014, the study of GAN has become so popular. For the past five years, there are many GANs out there. And these are several examples. There was one time that GAN became so fashionable that th there was a joke uh, in AI conferences that people say, if you want to get your paper accepted in top AI conferences in 2017, you better put a word GAN somewhere in your paper. In this tutorial, among all this type of GANs, I want to introduce Big Buy GAN in particular. Now we understand the basics of DC GAN. However, why do we need to study more GANs rather than DC GANs? Like, why do we propose new GANs such as Big Buy GAN? Isn't DC GAN good enough? Here I summarize a couple of disadvantages about uh, DC GAN. So the first disadvantage is that the sizes of these generated images are typically very small. It's even smaller than the sizes of ImageNet uh, images that we often input to the object recognition network. Second, uh, one generator is often responsible for generating only one object classes of images in the lecture given by Antonio Taroba last week. Uh, we knew that if we want to train and generator generating buildings, it's very unlikely that these generators can give you a dog images, for example. This is uh, very unsatisfying. Typically, we want a generator which can generate images across multiple object classes. But the reasons that, that we cannot do this is because we don't have constraints on the randomly sampled latent vector in this generator. Another disadvantage is that these images are typically of low resolution and it's lack of uh, high detail or high visual details. Not only that, even training DC GAN is very brutal. For example, sometimes the loss for the generator and the discriminator oscillate over numbers of, over numbers of epochs. As a testing stage, it's common to see the generator collapse meaning they lost the ability of generating diverse number of samples. And typically they will also, uh, they often generate like, for example, five, uh, five image examples from a class and then that's it. Since this is a battle between the generator and the discriminator, it's easy that the discriminator always wins the game and thus the generator, uh, the gradients of the generator diminishes since they can always lose it always loses and never wins no matter what. So uh, there are several empirical evidences suggesting that these networks are very sensitive to hyperparameter tunings during training. That's why we uh, here I want to introduce you uh, an advanced version of GAN, which is Big by GAN. This is the work published in NIPS uh, uh, last year from DeepMind. As its name indicates, it consists of two parts. It is a big GAN, and it is also bidirectional. So let me first introduce the, the, the part where it is big. 
as its name literally suggests, it is a big uh, neural net. It, it, it is trained with larger batch sizes and it has more network parameters. The authors have also introduced several architectural modifications. For example, they introduced skip connections of the latent vector. That is, they bypass the latent vector to the next layer after the first deconvolution layer and so on. Self-attention module turns out to be useful in many applications. The intuitive way to interpret this um, self-attention module is the following. Imagine you, you are an artist and you want to paint a dog that is sitting on the grass. Then this is, so the self-attention module does is to focus the, to pay more attention to the dog regions instead of the grass. So it, this is exactly what the self-attention module does. It helps you guide the network to focus on important regions to paint, such that we can generate more realistic uh, images. Next, let's talk about the bi-directional part, which is the part I found which uh, is very interesting. So here's what we see in the DC again. In order to uh, control what is in the latent code, authors introduce an encoder side by side. Uh, the generator. This is exactly the opposite of the generator, which takes the real images and encodes latent representation of uh, the head. Ideally, if the latent vector uh, carries the same essential information as the abstract information, then the generated images should look close enough as the real images. Thus, the discriminator has two extra jobs to do. In addition to the objective of telling the generated images from real or fake, it also has to distinguish the extracted representation of the real image from the latent coding in the generator, as shown here. Moreover, it also has to distinguish whether the joint distribution combining the encoded representation and its image is real or fake, which is it's going to take a pair of the, encoded, uh, the encoding as well as the, the image. With these two additional constraints, um, big gang can generate high quality images of larger image size, up to 512 uh, by 512. There are more tricks for constructing realistic images using GANs. For example, researchers have found that updating discriminator more often during training is very helpful. Taking the average of the model parameters is also beneficial. So here's what I meant. For example, in the first epoch, you update your generator parameter and uh, denote it as uh, WG1. Then in the second epoch, you update the parameter for the generator again as a WG2 and so on. As the testing stage, you compute the final parameter for the generator by taking the average of all the parameters over a number of epochs. Here are more tricks. We know that for each element in the latent vector, we randomly sample from the normal distribution with mean zero and the standard deviation of one. At the testing stage, instead of sampling from a normal distribution again, we are going to sample from the parts out of one sigma, let's say. This would help us input more extreme values into the latent vector, and thus it contrasts more realistic images. But then th there is a caveat. So this would sacrifice the sample diversity since the space we can sample from becomes smaller. During training the generator, we typically want to regularize the weights to be orthogonal. So here's an informal explanation, but I would encourage you to check out the actual paper. Like they provide empirical and uh, uh, analysis about this. So imagine you have two weight vectors. If they are orthogonal to each other, then they would share less uh, similarities compared with the two vectors shown on the right. Thus, imposing this orthogonal regularization, you actually push the network parameters to learn as many distinct features as possible. All right. Uh, we finished the machine learning part of the tutorial. Let us now move to the brain reading part in neuroscience. With all the basics of deep generating models in mind, we would, could ask ourselves the following question. If this random vector can generate images, 
can we actually plug in any brain codes into the generator and reconstruct its uh, corresponding images? One could imagine that the brain code could be any type. For example, it can be measured with any techniques in neuroscience and recorded from any brains of animal species. And in the future, instead of restricting ourselves into vision, we could also extend it to uh, five senses, for example, sound, touch, and a smell. And we could also uh, extend this to high level co cognitive functions such as emotions, memories, and languages. Before we uh, completely switch gear to review image reconstruction methods, let me now stop here for a couple of seconds and take one or two questions, if any. Great, uh, we've got a question from Anthony Chen. Uh, can you explain why having RELU activation uh, means we need to normalize pixel values to uh, negative one uh, comma one question mark? Uh, what, what do, sorry, can you repeat the first part? What is IOU activation? Uh, can you explain why having RE, uh, so capital R, little e, capital L, capital U, RELU activation means? Oh, I see. Got it. Yeah, so typically we have this uh, linear ReLU activations in the network. So that's where we zero out all the negative values in the layer. So imagine now if you don't normalize your uh, pixel distribution from minus one to one, let's say we stick with zero to one, then you, your, your ReLU function basically, so, uh, so basically you can treat ReLU as a, uh, it, as a thresholding um, mechanism that decides whether the value is going to be above zero or uh, below zero. And if it is below, then I'm going to zero out all the values. Therefore, you probably want to shift your image to pixel distribution uh, from one, minus one to one. Hopefully, uh, that, uh, this would provide a satisfying answer to your question. Uh, the next one is uh, anonymous is asking uh, why is it called self attention instead of just attention? Oh well, that's uh, because the self attention module, uh, like the the network itself, learns attention. So uh, typically, when people try to uh, say attention, you sort of like provide human supervision or um, human judgments into the model, like which parts of the image that you think are important. But here, the network actually just automatically computes attention values and the, the, the attention maps. So, yeah. Thanks. And we've got one more from Sumik Farhan. Uh, can you explain uh, more about the tricks for image reconstruction? I mean, what could be the strategy if you want to look at the output of some patterns? Uh, what? Well, I don't quite understand what you mean by strategy of the patterns, but I, I would imagine, so let's say if you want to interpret a, a target uh, unit in this generated models, you could, maybe we could, I, I haven't done this before, but I would imagine Let's see, you, we could use similar ways as what Deep Dream has been doing, which is you try to compute the loss of certain features of the uh, target unit in certain layers, then iteratively amplify, uh, take the gradients and iteratively amplify it with respect to the generated images. All right. So th this is a relatively new and fast growing research area. After literature review, what I found was only papers on image reconstruction from brain signals. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, find any literature about reconstruction of other modalities, for example, music. In this later half of the tutorial, I will briefly go through some of the representative works on image reconstruction methods. I divided the reconstruction methods into two groups. One is based on gradient back propagation, which was mainly inspired by deep dream and texture synthesis. First, I should clarify that this gradient back prop methods are not generating models. Since this tutorial, I'm going to focus on generating models. 
I will only briefly introduce the key ideas behind this algorithm, but I strongly recommend you to check out these papers by yourself. So the first two pieces of work shown here are inspired by the idea similar to uh, similar as Deep Dream. This algorithm is used for visualizing the patterns learned by a particular unit or layer from a neural net. It overinterprets and amplifies the patterns it sees in an image. Deep Dream does so by first forwarding an image through the network, then calculate the gradient of the image with respect to the activations of a particular layer. Then the image is modified to increase the, those activations, enhancing the patterns seen by the network, resulting in dreamlike images. Another piece of work worth mentioning is the study of uh, neural responses in V1, where uh, they use this uh, texture-like pictures. What these authors did is first, they take a, a natural image, pass it to a pre-trained neural net. It takes another white noise image and pass through the neural net again. Then the texture synthesizer computes the squared mean, error, mean squared error of the gram matrix as a target layer, for example, COM3 in this case. And it back propagates the loss with respect to the white noise image. The generated image has uh, this texture looking like. So to put this in layman term, the goal of the texture uh, synthesizer is to preserve the structure content of the target layer in a neural net. What is interesting is that these authors found that these synthesized texture images share similar view and neural responses and what has been observed in the natural images. Okay, no, so now let's uh, move on to the generating model-based methods. One of the key problems we need to solve is how we can translate the brain signals into this latent random codes, which uh, the, the generator understands. One of the straightforward solution is we don't need to perform translation between the brain signals to these latent codes. Instead, we could directly take these brain codes as inputs to the generator and fine tune the parameters of the generator to make it adapt to our new brain codes. So here is a representative work where the authors uh, ask participants to see a bunch of images and obtain their uh, brain codes. Here, each latent vector represents a piece of code corresponding to an image. Then the generator takes the brain codes directly as inputs and they reconstruct the images. Just as uh, a standard GAN training, authors impose discriminator losses to tell whether the images are the real images or reconstructed ones from the brain signals. In addition, the authors introduce another two losses to impose constraints at both the pixel level and feature levels. That is, the reconstructed images should look as similar as possible as the real image. At the testing stage, the generator is fixed, and then we could take directly the brain codes and plug it in to construct the image. On the right, the two bottom rows shows the reconstructed images from the two subjects using fMRI signals. Again, I want to emphasize that one could easily imagine that we can replace the fMRI signal with other type of brain codes and adopt the similar approaches for image reconstruction. Of course, the generator already contains many parameters and this method would require intensive amount of data in order to fine tune the generator. So next, we will explore alternative approach, which is to fix the generator parameters and instead try to look for the best latent codes that would drive the neurons to fire as much as possible. Here's how the algorithm works. So let's start from a bunch of noise vectors, just as what we did before. The generator uses these old latent codes to generate a bunch of images. And then we present these generated images to monkeys and record their neural responses in the form of spike trends. Uh, just a quick recap from Ethan's tutorial last week on processing neural data, we could treat, treat this uh, spike trends as a binary vector and compute its average firing rates. For example, we could take the mean of the, this spike trend and we get a number. For example, this is 30 hertz for the first image and 20 hertz for the second image. Since our goal is to drive the neuron to fire as much as possible, 
we use this computed mean firing rates as the fitness score for each image code. In this paper, authors pro propose to use the genetic algorithm to select the best parents, then cross over mutate them to get the next generation of codes. After the optimization, we have a new population of code and then the generator could generate a new batch of images and this process iterates. So here, uh, so what I'm showing here is a single synthetic image involving over generations. This method is a closed loop system because it involves the monkey brains in the loop and then it requires many iterations in order to find the best stimuli. Next, I will introduce a simpler way of establishing the mapping function between the latent code and the brain signal via linear regression. Again, the generator are fixed in this case. Just a quick recap. So in BigGAN, we have an encoder which encodes the abstract representation of the real images. And after training, this uh, latent representation carries similar features as the latent code Z. Thus, we could make use of this relationship to help us find the best mapping function. So let's see, uh, we have total N training uh, images. For each image, we could pass them through the pre-trained encoder from the big, big by gain. Let's concatenate this feature vector from all the images as a big matrix called generator matrix. It is of dimension 120 by N. Next, we could similarly represent these images to animals and extract those uh, brain signals, concatenate them and name it as brain matrix. It is of dimension NV by N. Since we have the generator matrix and the brain matrix, we could easily perform a linear regression between two of them. Specifically, this is to establish a linear mapping by computing the weight matrix, which is of a dimension NV by 20. And then um, we also have the generator matrix, which is 120 by N, so we could calculate the weight matrix. Uh, here are some uh, practice, uh, uh, pra practice uh, issues that we have to take note. For example, W might not be invertible, so we could take the pseudo inverse, and the brain matrix size might be very big, and we can perform dimension reduction using PCA to pre-process the data. Since the scale of the brain signal might be different from the latent code, we also want to perform uh, normalization of the brain signal first. All right, so at the, the testing stage, we could simply make use of the weight matrix. We just compute it and transform this brain signal to latent code, and then pass this latent code back to the generator in big by again for image reconstruction. On the right, uh, so yeah, so on the right, what you see here are the reconstructed images using fMRI signal. Again, the linear regression method could be generalized to other forms of brain signals as well. Then after reviewing all this image reconstruction methods from brain signals, you might have your own personal judgments about which brain reader is the best. In order not to be subjective, the next question we want to ask is, can we come up with a quantitative evaluation metrics to evaluate all these brain readers? And the answer is clearly yes. So similar as brain scores proposed in Jim DiCarlo's lab, evaluating the relationship between state-of-the-art object recognition uh, network and the neural responses in the brain, here we propose to add in additional metrics to evaluate the deep generating models and report their relationship to the brain signals. If, uh, yeah, I think we still have plenty of time, so let me just uh, introduce you each of these uh, metrics uh, individually. So first, inception score. It measures both the image quality and the diversity. Here's how the score is computed. First, it reflects the image quality. So let's see, we have a generated image and then we, we, we pass it to object recognition network. Here we are using inception three, but it, it could be any other recognition network. It outputs a vector uh, indicating the classification probability for each object classes. If the reconstructed image is of very good quality, that is the network has higher confidence recognizing what the object is, then the label distribution would be unimodal. 
resulting in a lower uh, entropy score. For those who don't understand what entropy is, it basically reflects the uncertainty of a distribution. Conversely, if the network barely recognizes what's the reconstructed images, then we will end up with a uniform label distribution, which results in a higher entropy score. In this case, the lower entropy score, the better the image quality is. Moreover, we want to evaluate whether the brain reader has enough image diversity. For example, if the network always generated dog images, no matter what latent codes you give to the network, then I would say this network is very bad because it fails to capture the diversity of object classes. Thus, if we want to, uh, if we can take the sum of the classification probability for all the reconstructed images, we would expect it to end up with a more uh, focused distribution since the generator always generated dog images. In contrast, if the generator could evaluate multiple object classes, like showing here, we have elephants, cats, dogs, etc., then the sum of all these classification vectors would give us a more uniform distribution, therefore a higher entropy, which is good. Overall, we want a more focused label distribution for better image quality, but a more uniform distribution for diversity. In order to combine the uh, both aspects together, inception score finally computes the KL divergence between these two distributions. The higher the KL divergence score, the better it reflects the model's ability to generate good images and uh, uh, these diversified class object classes. Note that uh, this inception score discards the information about the real images because you only uh, calculate the image quality and image diversity based on the generated images. It has nothing to do with the real images. Therefore, uh, we are proposing a new metric, which is the Fratchett uh, inception distance, short for FID. For both the reconstructed and the real images, we could use the inception net to extract their feature vectors. Thus, for each real and generated image pairs, we have a pair of feature vectors. The FID calculates the distance between these two distributions. A better brain reader gives a lower distance score. So here's a, form, a mathematical formulation of FID, which basically calculates the distance between the mean vector and the trace of their covariance differences. So here is the third metric for evaluating brain readers. Again, this is a, a big by game architecture. I want you to focus on the encoder part again. So for each generated image, the encoder could take them as inputs and outputs their feature vectors. If this encoder representation reflects the information about subject categorization, then these features from the generated images should look good enough for classification on ImageNet. We therefore could train a simple classifier, predict their class labels on ImageNet, and report their top one accuracy. If the brain reader constructs meaningful uh, natural looking images, which corresponds with uh, the real images, then the top one classification accuracy would be very high. In the big by GAN paper, I'm quite surprised that the author reported 61% uh, top one accuracy on this image net and using the purely unsupervised learning. All right, so we could also conduct human behavioral experiments to evaluate these brain readers. Here is the experiment paradigm. Let's see, we have the input image represented to the humans uh, and then as targets. We could then randomly choose one reconstructed image based on the brain signals from that target image. As a negative sample, we could randomly pick another reconstructed image from a non-target image. From this, with these three images, we proceed to conduct the behavioral experiments using mechanical, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. This is how it looks like in an example trial. So in the experiments, the subject is instructed to choose either option A or B that is more visually similar with the target image. After we collect the human choices on many uh, trials, we could simply report the accuracy of human judgments. 
now I'm showing you, you know, now I want you to pay attention to the um, bar on the right, highlighted in red here. The dash line is the chance level, which is 50%. Uh, in the paper, authors reported there are about 90% of people choosing correctly. That is, they prefer the options, which are reconstructed images based on the brain signals generated after the subject sees the target image instead of the non-target image. All right, at last, uh, we could also assess the controllability of this risk constructed images at the neuron level. So here is an illustration of what I meant. We first record the average neuron firing rate of monkeys after they see the real pictures. Then we could test monkeys on their corresponding reconstructed images and record their firing rates. Next, we show a scatter, uh, scatter plot where the X and Y axis indicates the firing rate of the real and reconstructed images. We put a dot for each pair of the average neural firing rates between the real and the reconstructed images. And here are more dots for the second pair of images and third pair and so on. Now we can fit a line and report their linear correlation. So the higher the linear correlation implied uh, reconstructed images capture more essential features. All this brain um, score assessments would, uh, we discussed so far could also be applicable with other types of brain signals. All right, so just to conclude, nowadays there have been fascinating progresses about deciphering brain codes using machines and interpreting the machine codes using brain responses. Hopefully, not far from the future, we could find a perfect bijection which could translate between these two types of codes. With this bijection, it's possible that one day we could st uh, stimulate and control any part of the brain. Last but not least, I want to conclude the tutorial with an illustrative figure showing you a hypothetical di diagram of uh, the brain machine interface for the visually impaired. With the joint efforts of the neuroscience and AI researchers, one could imagine that one day we could help the visually impaired by um, inserting a camera in front of the eyes and uh, the, the neural network in a pocket could be embedded in a pocket processor. It extracts the machine codes and translate it to brain understandable language. And this could be task dependent and it could be text reading or face identification of obstacle avoidance. In the end, it could translate the brain understandable codes via a uh, wireless transmitter on the scalp and uh, uh, use the electrodes embedded, electrode arrays embedded in the brain to stimulate the brain. Uh, a general question, how do we know brain signals contribute to the generated images? The generator also can generate similar images by inputting a random latent code space, right? Yeah, that's a very good question. But if let's see, it's, I mean, I'm not sure about the DC GAN case because it always generates, generates uh, images from one object classes. But if let's see for the big by GAN case, um, the, the, so if the generator ignores whatever in the latent code, it's probably gonna, generate images from different object classes compared with the image that is actually presented to the animals, right? So for example, if I'm presenting the monkeys with a dog image, and if I'm just randomly plugging another random noise vector to the generator, and the, gener the, the generator is probably going to generate a cat image instead of dog. And that's why in the evaluation metrics that we introduce the top one uh, classification score on ImageNet and hopefully that, that could clarify your question. Thanks. Uh, next one's from Jad. Uh, is fMRI more adapted than a EEG to this problem? Can we expect more precise reconstructions with EEG? Is there a way to combine input from both, ME or from both EEG and fMRI? Uh, that's an interesting question. I'm not, so just to clarify, I'm not from neuroscience background. I couldn't say too much about it, but I would imagine, uh, 
Yes, and why not? I mean, for me, any type of brain signals is just uh, like a series of numbers and then if we could interpret them correctly and analyze them uh, normalize them correctly then I don't see the reasons why this brain codes cannot be represented in one way on or another why does increasing the activation create dreamlike images so, so the the name is deep dream I think it's probably just saying you know this weird looking dog is looks like a dream that you just had, right? So, but then from, at the algorithmic level, uh, what it basically does is just to amplify the, the activations of the target units in the target layer. So I don't, I, I mean, this is a su subjective card. It actually depends on how you interpret them, right? 